How would you like to hear directly from one of the top quarterbacks in West Virginia football history? He's top 10 in almost every category. He's partially responsible for one of the greatest plays in Mountaineer football history and arguably one of the greatest in backyard brawl history. Played for the legendary coach Don Nealon and just so happens to be from good old West Virginia. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking about Chad Johnston. Stick around because Chad is joining the show right after this word from our sponsor. Ladies and gentlemen, this episode is brought to you by Dutch Miller Automotive, where friends and family pricing means you get the best deal right up front on any new or pre-loved vehicle in stock every time. With brands like Chevrolet, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram, Kia, Hyundai, Ford, GMC, Buick, and Subaru, the Dutch Miller Automotive family is always growing and ready to put you in the car or truck you've been searching for. Check out our inventory across West Virginia at DutchMillerAuto.com or come in today to the home of friends and family pricing only at a Dutch Miller Automotive store near you. I am privileged to be joined by one of the greatest quarterbacks to ever suit up in the old gold and blue, and he just so happens to be from the greatest state in the nation, good old West by God, Virginia, and I'm talking none other than number eight, Mr. Chad Johnston. What's up, man? How you doing? I'm good. How about yourself? Doing great. I appreciate you taking time to uh, come on here and chat it up about football for a bit. Yeah, I'm excited to, you know, uh, especially after this season, uh, I think the Mountaineers back on the map and, and uh, it's been a good time being golden blue. That's for sure. Absolutely, man. No doubt. Hey, uh, before we get into football, I just, I want you to kind of fill the listeners in on what's Chad Johnson up to today. Uh, I currently live uh, in Giles County, Virginia, which is uh, between Blacksburg and my hometown of Peterstown. Uh, I work mainly in Blacksburg, Virginia. I have a dermatology office there, and the, and the name of that practice is River Ridge Dermatology. And it's funny, people ask, why do you why why'd you come up with that name? Well, at the time, especially, I, my kids were in school and mm-hmm. ball, and I said, where's – well, I either spend my time at, at, at a ball game or I'm at work. And so the name of the district that Blacksburg, Christiansburg, Pulaski, the Roanoke team's playing is the River Ridge District. So that's how we got the name of, of River Ridge Dermatology. So, you know, I, I have an office, a small office in Giles County. So I see a lot of people from Princeton and Bluefield in that area, mm-hmm. or even my home county of Monroe County. So right. you'll see a lot of West Virginia people. And, and uh, so it's, um, I'm very, very privileged and blessed to, to do what I do for a living. That's awesome, man. It's a great story. Um, and you got your doctorate from West Virginia, I imagine? I did. I uh, I actually, uh, you know, got my undergrad at WVU. I went to med school in Lewisburg. I went to the uh, West Virginia okay. School of Medicine, but then I went back to WVU and did my residency. So gotcha. Okay. I did a tour of, of four years in Morgantown, and uh, it's kind of funny. It's a little bit different. Going, you know, I was married and had kids, and and mm-hmm. uh, residency. So it's a little bit different being a uh, do, being just the resident of Morgantown rather than a student or a student. Right. I'm sure it is different. Uh, I. I didn't get a doctorate, but I did. I went to college after I got married and had kids too. So it's definitely a whole lot different than, you know, the quote unquote college experience, right? Correct. Yes. Much <laughs> you know, all the places I used to go downtown um, several years prior, I tried to avoid those places. I hear you. Yeah. Not good for a married man with a family for sure. Um, now let's jump back a little bit. You have a very interesting story as in, in my opinion, and I'll say I'm a guy from Southern West Virginia. I grew up, you know, just within an hour of where you did. So uh, Monroe County is just the next one county over for me. And obviously, we, you and I have some mutual acquaintances, mutual friends. And yours, I find your story very, very interesting because you didn't play your entire high school career in West Virginia. Correct. Uh, so can you kind of tell the audience a little bit about your high school story and, and kind of how that uh, how that played out for you? Sure. You know, my, my parents um, were divorced when I was younger and I lived with my dad for the most part. Uh, but at one point in time, my dad, my stepdad and my mom were all in the same school, Peterstown High School. And and I, I'd gone there, you know, all the way through till ninth grade. And in, my, and in between my ninth and tenth grade year, my dad um, got a job opportunity in Craig County High School, uh, hired as an administrator and in football and baseball coach. Uh, which is, uh, you know, Craig County actually uh, borders Monroe County. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
little bit north of Giles County. So uh, I went there for uh, for a year, my sophomore year of high school, and I played ball there, you know, football, basketball, baseball, and uh, made a lot of great friends and uh, even some friends I still have today that I see occasionally in and around Blacksburg and Roanoke. And, um, um, you know, it was, kind of, it was funny as, as I never thought I'd ever see a place that made Peterstown look big, but Newcastle did. Uh, <laughs> Craig County High School. I think we had like 30 kids in our class. Wow. Um, but um, uh, I've, I often told people, you know, it allowed me to go and leave home out of my comfort zone. I made really good friends and I played, you know, I played ball. I uh, had probably a little bit different role uh, there than I did uh, growing up in Peterstown. But it also made that transition when I moved from from Peterstown to Morgantown, you know, I didn't really, I mean, I was a little bit homesick because it was two a days and, you know, that's mm -hmm. never fun, but, um, you know, I, I really knew I could go there and be fine. And as far as, uh, stability wise and fitting in with people, I, I really, I really didn't have any fear of that. Right. Well, that's awesome. You, um, uh, now obviously you had a, uh, you played some wide receiver, right? When you, Yes. Oh, yeah. Kind of got before you transferred out. Yes. I, so I left, and I'd always played quarterback at Peterstown from the time I was in fourth grade all the way through to a ninth grader, and then my uh, my sophomore year I left uh, and I went and I played quarterback at Craig County High School. But mm -hmm. in the in the year that I was gone, um, a kid named Kerry Stauffer moved in, um, and you know Peterstown went undefeated, went to the state championship game, lost to Mount Hope. Um, and, you know, Kerry kind of solidified himself as a starter. I moved back and, um, really I missed the first couple of weeks of practice, you know, in West Virginia. It's funny because I coached football in Blacksburg high school, mm -hmm. you know, Black high school or say Virginia, you, you practice a couple of days in shorts, you put some pads on, you can play within just like three or four days. But in West Virginia, you have to have 14 practice days. So, um, I didn't move back. My first day of practice was, um, uh, the first scrimmage game and I was actually ineligible the first game of the season. I didn't have mm. practice. So, you know, I had the opportunity. We kind of, the two of us played a little bit back and forth, um, but to kind of, you know, better for the team that I played wide receiver that year and Kerry continued to play quarterback. And, you know, he was a great leader, was a great quarterback. Uh, I think he was all state actually his senior year. Mm. Um, my junior year, I was, you know, I was a wide receiver, played defense. I actually made all state as a defensive back. We, we went, uh, we made it to the state championship game again and lost. And then, you know, really that year of playing receiver motivated me more so uh, than anything to really, you know, show what I could do at the quarterback position. And so, uh, the following spring, I talked to my mom about going to a um, a specialty camp. Uh, just learning fundamentals is basically mm -hmm. what. So I went to a specialty camp down in Georgia, uh, did some, a lot of fundamental work. I spent most of the summers, I've, I've told this story many times, you know, I just didn't show up throwing. Uh, I mean, I could always throw, you know, my dad, mm -hmm. he was a pitcher at Concord and pitched in the Orioles organization. So I was always his lab rat when, when, when I was a kid, as far as pitching, but then, um, but football was a little bit different motion. And just a little bit different, not a whole lot of uh, different mechanics, but uh, you know, I had to work on my release a little bit. And I used to take a bag of about 15 footballs and, and a couple of kicking nets. And I would spend hours down to field at Peterstown, just throwing back and forth by myself and doing these drills I learned. And, and basically that's where it all started for me was, was down on that field at Peterstown in, in the summer of, of 91. And then things just kind of took off as far as, you know, our team was, was very good, uh, uh, you know. Coming from a small school to to actually have guys that could that could run and catch and and guys that could block and do mm -hmm. all the amazing. Just uh, uh, I used to keep that. You know, we've moved around our office a little bit. I used to keep that picture of that state championship team uh, on my wall all the time in my office when I actually had an office because that group of guys, you know, they really changed my life, and um, I'm very grateful to them. That's awesome. You know, there have been. For those who aren't familiar with West Virginia high school football, Peterstown was a small class A school. Single A is the smallest, you know, West Virginia is a small state anyway, right? Class A is the smallest of the smallest as far as high schools go. A lot of the single A high schools in West Virginia weren't even big enough to have a football team. I mean, I grew up uh, in the Matoka area where we didn't even have 
football at the time. All they had was basketball. They had a baseball team for a short period of time, but it didn't last long. So it was basically basketball, cross country, and that was about it. So very small school. Nowadays, they have con- since then, they've now consolidated with uh, another county high school called Union High School to form what they call James Monroe. But, man, there have been so many great athletes come out of that part of the state. It is unbelievable, uh, especially back when you played at Peterstown. I mean, you, if you got yourself, you've got Travis Jackson, who played basketball at Virginia Tech, right? Yes, yes. You've got Kelly Mann, who played uh, who played basketball at Virginia Tech, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And, I mean, there are others, right? Oh, yes. I mean, if you look, kind of funny, uh, we always we talk about a high school career and you talk about football, but really basketball was the sport that we were probably better in. Mm-hmm. And that's – Unfortunately, we don't have a trophy to show for it. But, you know, our starting five, you had me, uh, Travis, and Kelly. Uh, then you had Rodney Allen, who who walked on to WVU in football and baseball, then played a little mm-hmm. professional baseball after that in the minors. Uh, Howie Castillo uh, also mm-hmm. walked on at WVU and then transferred to Concord and was like their all-time leading receiver there. And that mm-hmm. was, you know, it was like five of our skill guys and uh, it was amazing to have that that many guys there. that's why i say it was, it's i'm very fortunate the group of guys i played with and then yeah. some of the other names you, you and i talked about early matt man that's kelly's older brother you know that his class really started changing things you know getting back to a winning tradition there uh in the in the late 80s you know they were good in really just about everything and mm-hmm. you know state championship baseball and so um you know, we had a run there even in the early years of James Monroe, and, and a lot of those guys were Peterstown guys. It, it, it was amazing to see, mm-hmm. over, uh, especially skill guys that came through through that area. Yeah, and and I played against James Monroe when I was in high school. They were good then, and they're still good. I mean, their their football tradition there is one of the tops in the state, especially in the southern part of the state. I mean, they've got one of the best football programs I have for a long time. So it's pretty amazing what they've done. The, the sports tradition in that county is unbelievable, man. Uh, yeah, it's it's been it's been really good. And then I think you're starting. It's funny you're getting some of the kids of the, mm-hmm. the they ball with or yep. around the era. So to see some of those kids come through and and mm-hmm. they are you guys now. I mean, I've watched a few of their games on Facebook Live and and uh, you know went to the state championship game a couple of years ago. So you know it's good to see. It. And of course, they've won a couple in basketball. So they've had to yeah. It's still small schools, so those small schools, you know, you get you're good in one sport, usually good in a couple. So it's right. good, good to see those kids carry on the tradition. Yeah, absolutely, man. I love it. I love uh, these, you know, southern teams. I love to see Southern West Virginia represented, you know, in state tournaments and state championships. I mean, this past year there were two teams from Southern West Virginia in the Super Six and Wheeling. There was Greenbrier West, which is not that far away, and then we had Princeton made it to the state championship for the first time in school history. Uh, you no, know, they got they got their doors blown off by Martinsburg, who's a you know they're a juggernaut in high school football in West Virginia. But but for them to even get there was was a was a huge huge feat. And there were a lot of there was a lot of blue and wheeling for that game. I can tell you. Uh, that's my understanding. You know, we're there's uh, I have a, a, a text um, line that goes with uh, some of my former teammates and and one of that group. There's six of us that talk virtually every single day all day long and that's awesome and tanner russell's one of those guys and so yeah. tanner, he lives in wheeling now and, and i saw him last year when james Monroe played there i got, went up and hung out with him uh before the game and, and got to see him but uh, but there's a group of us that we talk every day we actually yeah. get south jersey um every summer the last few summers so uh uh, you know, he's very excited to have all his, his uh, friends and family from Princeton come up to, to Wheeling to play in the, in the state championship. Yeah, that's, you know, Tanner's another, another Southern Western guy who represented uh, at WVU, was a starting lineman at WVU. Did, did you and him play there at the same time? We were there. I, uh, I was a senior. He was a true freshman. So okay. I've, known, I've known Tanner for a long, long time. And, and uh, you know, our dads went to Concord together. So, you know, I've known his family for quite a while. Yeah. Yeah, I think Tanner graduated from Princeton when I was – I think he was a senior at Princeton. I was a freshman at Pikeview, so we played against each other. Okay. Uh, All right. Sort of. I, I didn't play a lot as a freshman, yeah. but I, I but I remember him. And, man, he he was a monster of a man, I can tell you. The mountain of a man. He would fill the door up if he walked in here. Yeah. Too. Very talented, very good. I mean, he, he ate our – the lineman we had at the time, and I can't remember who it was off the top of my head, but he ate his lunch pretty much, which, <laughs> you know, was kind of to be expected. But 
Uh, and we had some talented guys on, on the team at that point at Pikeview. There was a couple. There was a couple D one guys on that team, but uh, but Tanner was kind of a you know he stood out among everybody for sure. Not only his size, but just his ability. Hmm. But uh, so yeah, another Southern West Virginia guy, man. It's awesome. Um, Matt told me when I talked to you to make you tell this story. Uh, <laughs> something about your helmet turning sideways. You know what he's talking about? Oh, what was he talking about when I was at Tech? I got uh, I, I played over at Tech uh, on the, we played on a Thursday night. And I it's kind of the time that I would that I had I uh, had taken the starting job back over because I went back and forth with a guy named Eric Boykin, mm -hmm. uh, who transferred from Michigan, and he he started that game. I finished it, but. Uh, you know, everyone talks about that. Uh, I took this huge hit and I got my helmet knocked off over there. At yeah. What people don't understand is when I was, I got flushed out of the pocket, I was rolling out, you know, my chin strap actually came undone. So like I was actually running, trying to snap that thing back on uh, and uh, as, as contact was coming. And so, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that's back in the day when you actually hit the quarterback. So I didn't right. try to slide or anything. And so I took a big, big hit. And my helmet went up in the air and yeah. And, Everyone thought it was this devastating hit. I mean, it was a pretty good hit, but the fact was my chin strap <laughs> before the, that ever took place. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a cool story, man. Um, but, hey, I couldn't let you go. Matt would never let me hear the end of it if I didn't ask you that. You know that, right? Oh, yeah, I know that. <laughs> um, I, I, I've got to ask you, in my opinion, one of the most iconic plays in West Virginia history and definitely one of the ones in backyard brawl history was – that 1990, I think it was 94 game when you made that pass to Zach Abraham to win the game in the backyard brawl. Can you walk, can you kind of walk us through that play a little bit? Yeah. Well, you know, if you didn't know anything about football and how to score points um, in a, in a ball game, you just watch that game because there are points scored, you know, there's actually, you know, there's touchdown passes, there's runs, there's intercept mm -hmm. returns for touchdowns. I think we intercepted a two point, conversion attempt and returned it for uh, a two-point conversion. Um, I think they blocked a field goal attempt and returned it for a touchdown. Um, we had six. I mean, there was a ton of different, uh, different um, uh, scoring plays in that game. But we had um, – you know, we jumped out to a pretty big lead. I think it was like 35 to 17 or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, at halftime. And – you know, especially in those days, I mean, that's a lot of points just for a whole game. And, and we had that at halftime and we kind of were trying to shorten the game by running the ball and doing some things. And, and, uh, Pitt just kept blitzing the whole game. And in this whole second half, they just, they brought the house, singled everybody. Mm -hmm. So with about two minutes left, uh, we got backed up on our own 20 and, uh, it was third and 10 and they brought the house and, and the slot receiver, Rasan Vanderpool, made a little move. I threw it over the top. I mean, I only threw the ball about 20 yards, and, and he took the rest away. Um, and um, uh, we had – I think Pitt had come back and tied it uh, right up to that point. And, you know, we kicked the extra point, went ahead by seven. And then um, they get the ball back, go down two-minute offense, go down score, and they go for two and, um, and get it with, you know, just probably around 20 seconds left in the game. And so mm -hmm. kick off – we get the ball back probably around the 30 first play of the game. We're just running four verticals, just trying to get the ball down the field. And, and, you know, I have seen, I had seen Todd Salbron, even though it was not our kicker, he was our punter. I had seen mm -hmm. him kick 70 yard field goals in Mountaineer field before practice. So right. knew at worst, if we could just get it across midfield, we could send him out there and, and possibly he could kick one through. And so uh, first play, um, you know, I, I was flushed out of the pocket, stepped up, ran for about 10 yards, got it out to about the 40. And uh, the next play, we we uh, ran the same thing, just four verts down the field. And um, I was actually looking out to the left um, to Brisson Vanderbilt, who was our slot receiver to the left on the hash, and I was going to try to hit him down the middle of the field, you know, maybe get the ball down low where he could slide and catch it and we could run up and ground it real quick. Um, but, um, you know, he, I got, I got flushed. I stepped up and as I was stepping up, love it. Purnell was on the hash that I was running down and he kind of got, you know, uh, held up at the line of scrimmage. He really wasn't that, that deep. And, and, uh, before I crossed the line of scrimmage, I just looked up at Zach running down the sideline and DB kind of just stopped his feet. And, you know, the, you know, the saying, if he's even, he's leaving. And so yeah. you know, even I let it go and, and, uh, he ran under it and, and, uh, of course the rest is history. Yeah. 
Wow. Awesome. Thanks for that breakdown. You know, you brought up some names there, which you had mentioned, Rashawn, you know, about the pass to him in the previous drive, and then uh, Love It Purnell. Man, those guys, man, that brings back – those are guys that Mountaineer fans don't talk enough about, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, Love It there, was- there were a lot of good players on that. Love It Purnell played in the NFL for several years, yeah. didn't he? Yeah, he was really ahead of his time. I mean, he was kind of – it's kind of what those guys are now. I mean, he wasn't the biggest guy. He was about 245, probably 250. But if you actually watch film and, and if he got a clean release off the line of scrimmage, five yards – five to ten yards down the field, he was faster than our wide receivers. So, um, you know, he was a real weapon. Uh, you know, and we were together my first two years of starting. He actually came in my class, but he was a prop. So, he, he you know, mm-hmm. he – for years. So, um, I always make this argument that – if all the offensive guys would have made it to the end, we had like two or three guys really have terrible injuries. And then you add in the defensive class that we already had that you, you saw them my senior year. Uh, mm-hmm. One of the greatest classes ever to go through uh, at WVU. Yeah. Great point. So, uh, yeah, but, yeah there've been a lot of West Virginia teams over the years that have been, uh, and I guess every team can say that though, but they've been impacted by injury a lot, you know? <laughs> Yes, you know, we had several on the offensive guy. By, by the time we we finished, um, it was me, uh, Mike Horn, and, and Rasan Vanderpool were the only three that made it all the way through to the end. And we we probably lost like five or six guys along the way. Or it yeah. could have been a much different offense going through um, right. last year. Yeah. Um. After you after you left West Virginia, um, you you did spend a little bit of time with the Carolina Panthers organization. Uh, yeah. What was that like? Uh, it was much different, you know. It, you know, obviously, it's a business, and and it's a very high pressure, high intensity situation. I learned a lot of things during that point in time, um, and um, you know, I, I was, I had really put myself in position that I was going to be the backup to um, Kerry Collins and Steve Berline, and then Collins got his jaw broken in a preseason game, and so as a as a uh, undrafted rookie free agent, I became the backup very quick. Mm-hmm brought in uh, Shane Matthews who played at the University of Florida, but he played for Joe Pendry, who was our offensive coordinator, you know, Joe's. Right. Um, uh, they brought him in. He played for Joe in Chicago. So they brought him in and I think he ended up even starting a little bit for him as the season went on. But it was one of those things, you know, they tried to get me back on practice squad throughout the season and, you know, just, it just never worked out. And, you know, one of the funny parts about my stories, I got a call about week, eight or 10 to go to St. Louis when the Rams were there. And um, so I flew out to St. Louis and it's funny, Van Washington, who was in my class, he was there too. He was in the airport waiting on me. They, they picked me, me and Van up at the same time. And, and we both had a workout the next day uh, for the Rams. And I had a great workout. I really thought they were going to sign me and, and I uh, had really good talks with them. And they said, well, we, we worked out another guy a few days ago. And it's really between the two of you, we're going to send you to NFL Europe uh, to Amsterdam. Um, mm-hmm being our guy and uh, and so i didn't hear anything for about a week and and um finally my agent's time called and said you know we've signed the other guy he's been the top arena league quarterback the last couple of years and his name's kurt warner and yeah. so <laughs> so that's who uh, you know and, and so I, I actually went of course no one knew who kurt warner was at that point in time right so i um went and played arena football um the next spring for jay gruden because mm-hmm. about a before the draft, when I came out, John Gruden was the um, offense coordinator of the Eagles. Um, and I guess uh, probably Andy Reid was probably the head coach then. And, mm-hmm. and Gruden was his offense coordinator. He came to Morgantown, and I spent all day with, with him hanging out. He worked me awesome. out. We talked film. We talked, you know, you know, mm-hmm. you know just terminology, that sort of stuff. And uh, uh, so it wasn't quite like the um, – the series he did on ESPN when he was leading up to the draft the last several years, but it was pretty intense time and it was, it was a good time. And, and so, uh, you know, they called me on draft day and a couple other calls, but I didn't, you know, just nothing worked out as far as that goes, but I went and played for his brother, Jay, when he was the head coach at Orlando with the predators. Mm-hmm. And um, I went and played down there for a year. Awesome. And then, well, I, it's fun. I was, we were practicing at the, um, at the Citrus Bowl. And, um, you know, of course, Arena League is, what, seven players, and we were just down there practicing. But down at the other end of the field, there was an 11-on-11 um, team uh, practicing. And so I walked down and see, and I look, and the tight end looks real familiar, and it's Chad Wable. 
And so um, I'm sitting there talking to Wade when we hung out for a few days while he was, he was down there with that semi-pro team. And, and uh, he was talking about going to med school. And uh, I started, I started talking to him, well, what do I, what do you need to do for med school? And, uh, and, you know, I was a pre-pharmacy major my first mm-hmm. three years. And so he's the one that actually put the buzz bug in my ear to, to really think about going to med school. And so that wow. sort of, once, once football ended, that sort of became my new passion that kind of took the place for, for football. But it's not a bad one, man. I mean, heck, being a doctor, it's, that's a, it's, it's a really cool achievement and accomplishment. And, uh, I mean, heck, man, you've done, done a lot with your life. And, uh, well, appreciate that. That's very and, and you're, you know, you're, you're helping people. You're, you're, uh, you may not be, you know, everybody looks at NFL players as the, you know, quote unquote gods or heroes or whatever you want to call it. But at the end of the day, man, you're, you spent your life actually helping people, which is probably at the end of the day, that's more important than playing a game, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, you know, it's funny is, is, um, you know, I'm probably, you know, people, crit- you know, if they criticize me, whatever they do, that I'm I'm a much harsher critic on myself than anyone else. And Oh, yeah. Like, you know, personally, I feel like part of my career is not only, as, you know, as a Mountaineer and professionally, though, uh, that's incomplete, really. But I kind of felt like in the end, this is the track I'm supposed to be do- leading. Absolutely. The life I'm supposed to be leading, mainly because I can do more f- – um, do a lot more for people doing what I'm doing than I, than I could play in ball. Absolutely. So, Absolutely, uh, man. So it's been, you know, it's one of those things that like you, you think your life's supposed to go one way and then something else um, probably even better turns out. Uh, in- Absolutely. I, I tell, you know, I look back, which I didn't play college sports, but I, you know, I played sports all through high school and there were a lot of things I, I used to, I used to be somewhat bitter um, at, at some of my old coaches and then bitter at myself and, um, have some regrets about things I didn't do or that I should have done or vice versa. But I, you know, as I got older and got to thinking, I'm like, you know what? Everything that, that happened in my past led me to where I'm at today. I have a wife, three beautiful kids. I've got a great career. I get to talk football on the side. I mean, I've got a pretty darn good life. And uh, if all those stupid decisions I might've made or not made or whatever led me to this, it's hard to complain. Yep. <laughs> Very you know, true. Hard, hard to it's hard to regret it you know yeah. yes very true and and uh uh you know i didn't watch football for a long time i didn't watch um i didn't watch much i didn't go to games uh even you know my stepdad was coaching the james and row and those mm-hmm. early those really great teams with ben thornton and those guys and, right and um and i really just i just didn't go because I, I was just burnt out from it i had bad wow. taste from it and i just didn't go and it really took you know getting to the point <laughs> You know, I was I was actually back in Morgantown. I was uh, uh, I was doing my residency, but I always got wrangled in. The, I lived in the Cheat Lake area, uh, and I was a resident. I live on the lake. I just live in Cheat Lake area, but uh, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> but I um, I got wrangled into coaching. You know, all the rec league sports. So I would coach yeah. you know, football, basketball, baseball, and really, my oldest son started playing football when he was probably in third grade for the Cheat Lake Chargers, and. Uh, a guy named Scott Wordabaugh got me out to, to help start, you know, start to coach. And so uh, I started then and it really just changed. It brought the love of the game back for me, which was That's awesome. was great because it was such a big part of my life for a long, long time. And it was just, you know, it was, it was just sort of an empty void. Uh, yeah. so it was nice. And then, you know, I continued to coach when I moved to Blacksburg in 2009, you know, I continued to coach. I actually coached high school football for probably eight or nine years. Yeah, I saw that in when I was. I did a video on you the other uh, a couple weeks ago, and um, actually saw that on your bio. I did, I wasn't aware of that about you, so that's that's pretty cool. Yeah. I coach. I look, I coach a little bit of youth sports myself. I coach a travel basketball team there in Princeton. So uh, there's nothing nothing can replace the the thrill of watching a kid get better at a sport because they work hard at it. Uh, it's pretty cool to be a part of that. Yes, it's very cool. And, and if you coach, especially at high school level you you always have a senior every year that just comes out of nowhere you don't expect anything from and to see them mm-hmm. at the year i mean every year you can go through and just see year after year after year mm-hmm. like this kid we did who didn't really do much for us for two or three years all of a sudden is a big part of it and to see how they and uh, how it's you know it's become a big part of their life and you know one of the best things that i've actually had the opportunity of doing is is um 
you know, I, I work there in Blacksburg, but we also run a residency program through our office. And so, you know, we teach residents and do those things. And so we have med students all the time. I've got five former players that I coached at Blacksburg that have spent time with me, you know, either as an undergrad uh, um, or, you know, have, have went to med school and then spent time with me and rotated through. So, and I've gotten to, that's I'll, awesome write letters for them for to get into med school and so that's been you know as as you know as time goes on that's even bigger than wins and losses and oh, things man. So, you're impacting lives man it's it's much so much bigger than a game you know very true very true and i'm very it's very grateful very and to see those kids and how they change and a couple of them really had some really hard times as students and one in particular i remember thinking I don't know if he's going to be eligible to play for us. And now he's, you know, so it's, it's pretty amazing what, what he's done for himself. Yeah. Um, you know, and you, you know, I know you said that you put a lot of pressure on yourself or was your worst critic. Um, and obviously that's probably why you got to where you were, right? Cause you were hard on yourself. You probably were, were competitive, right? You were that competitive to get better and better and better. But and you, even though you may have had that bitter taste in your mouth, I could, you were one of the first. Uh, that play, that Zach Abraham play, is one of the earliest memories. I, I mean, I was a teenager, but I didn't follow Western football real closely at that time. I was just kind of an observer. But that play, man, is one of the first plays I remember watching that really got me paying more attention to West Virginia football. So it meant a lot to me. And two, man, you're top ten in almost every single category at West Virginia University. That's that's not that's something to be proud of, man. In my opinion, I mean, yeah. not, I, I'll be honest with you, and I, maybe I'm a little biased because you're from Southern West Virginia, but I think you should be in the Hall of Fame. Well, I, I mean, that's uh, that's uh, for you to say that. I appreciate that, and and uh, obviously that's for other people to to decide on. And and um, you know, when I think about you know my big brother, always says it's funny. I just ran into a Mexican restaurant earlier tonight. Is it Steve Newberry? And, yeah. He's like, I always say he's my big brother and, and yeah. his first year of coaching high school football, I was, um, I was a senior. And so, you know, it's, it's funny as he, he would call Neyland and really Dunlap is who he would call. He would call coach right. you know, Dunlap and say, you need to come down here and see this kid. You need to come down here and see it. And, and, um, and so, you know, I had the opportunity to follow in his footsteps and he's been a great example for me. And, and, yeah. uh, We'll see each other uh, quite a bit. Have lunch a lot of times when uh, I have this office over here in Giles County. So, mm-hmm. I, and so, um, you know, I, I, I feel very fortunate to have gone to West Virginia, and, and uh, you know, everything good in my life comes from the fact that I, I went to WVU. And and uh, you know, if if something like that happens, obviously it'll be a great honor, and it's a, it's a tribute. You know, you talk about I'm in those, you know, that I'm ranked and all those things, but it's really, you know, football is the ultimate team game. It's, it's everybody working together and mm-hmm. uh, play with great receivers and running backs and linemen. And, and so I had the opportunity to play with a lot of good guys there and, and, um, you know, got to do a lot of things, you know, it's, it's funny early on, they, uh, they turned things over to me very, very quickly. And, and, um, and I think about how the game's played now, I, I kind of miss that, you know, I got to control a lot of the, the, the plays at the line of scrimmage, even as mm-hmm. a soft. And now, you know, they call play and then they look over the sideline and they change the play. And, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes I think that that's what happens with some of these quarterbacks as they go to the NFL and why are they not as good? Well, you know, how much of that decision-making process did they have uh, compared to what we used to have to do? And yeah. so, I'm not saying it's better or worse. I'm just saying, you know, that's, that's why it's such a crap shoot at the, at the quarterback position. Yeah. That's a great point. And now they're going to have helmets. Now they're going to have uh, communications devices in the helmets. Have you heard about that? No, I have not. But I, but I hope they make it more like the pro game where they do that. And then, you know, you, you hear the pros all the time, you know, kill, 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 or you mm-hmm. know, stuff like that where they call two plays, the quarterback recognizes and he does it more so than the coach in there just telling, mm-hmm. you. you know, I, I, I just think that's, you know, I think that's part of the game is that, you know, it, it's a, it's, it's not just, I mean, there's a fine line between what the athlete's doing and, and, and you know, just what someone behind the, uh, behind the scenes is, is doing. Right. Yeah. I think a lot, I think at the end of the day, a lot of times it comes down to the coach is the coach comfortable giving up that, that authority, that power, that decision, whatever. And to the quarterback, 
do, do they have enough faith in that? I know when Dana Holgerson was there, he he used to talk about how uh, I think it was Will Greer, like mm-hmm. he he could just let Will almost call the plays himself if he want. I mean, right? You know, he had that much faith in him, and he Will had that kind of uh, that kind of football IQ, and I'm sure Coach Neal saw that in you too, or he wouldn't let you do it, right? Wouldn't let you make those changes, but. Um, but then there are some some coaches who who won't do that, who won't give up that control, um, and maybe a lot of times it just depends. Maybe they don't feel like that quarterback has the ability to do it. You know, I don't know. Uh, yeah, you know, there's a lot that goes into that decision. I'm sure. Yes, I mean, I, you know, I talked about earlier tonight. You know, talking about our current state, and you know, it's funny is when I think about Garrett Green and and mm-hmm. you know what did I think of him a year ago? What do I think of him now? And and how just I've always thought he was very talented. You know, he could always throw the football and he could run. Uh, but it seemed like from the messages you got from the coaching staff that, you know, maybe he didn't understand the passing game and that sort of thing. You know, it's it's one thing to pass when, you know, when the situation is good for you, but when it's a bad situation and everyone in the stadium knows you have to throw, that's when it gets, you know, that's when you find out who your guy is. And right feel like watching the game like against Houston we're down two scores and we need to move the ball very quickly down the field and everyone knows we're going to throw and he orchestrates that drive to do that and then he ended up doing that several times throughout the season and and so you know a lot of them are very excited about the growth that you saw from from Garrett Green but then the other part like gosh how much wasted time did we have with Garrett Green like this kid could have been doing this two years ago (laughs) so you know I don't, I just, uh, you, you know, it's, it's, um, uh, I, I would have liked to see him turn him loose, you know, a couple of years before that. Maybe he was ready. Maybe he was not. I, I don't know, but, but I don't think that switch just happens. I think it's, you know, most guys, uh, you know, for the most part, understand it and you can see it. Sometimes you got to live with some of the bad things, but, um, I just, um, I'm glad to see the success now, but, I, but I often think about on the flip side, I wish we'd have done this with him two years ago. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of fans have that same feeling. You know, Coach Brown always said he wasn't ready. He wasn't ready. Um, but, you know, I, I, Garrett Green to me seems like one of those guys. I think there's such – and you, I don't, maybe you disagree with this, Chad. I don't know. But I think there are, there are guys out there who are gamers. Yes, I agree. Who, when the lights come on, they're a totally different player and a better player than they are on, on a practice field. Correct. I agree. And, he, and like, obviously, I don't see Garrett Green at practice every day, but he just seems like he has that in him. Like, yeah. you know, I don't know. Do you and see that too? Probably around him, you know, he he um, uh, he's got a little fire. He not a le- little fire. He's got he's got a lot of fire about him. Mm-hmm. He's got grit. Um, he's tough. Uh, he can make plays with his feet. He can make plays with his arm. Um, so you know, and that's what you got to have in today's game. You know, it's not about being six foot five and just standing back there and throwing it around anymore. You know, especially in the college game. And so, um, you know, I'm a big fan of his. I, I was. I yeah. was I wasn't sure what we had for a couple of years with him, but now, like I said, now I feel like, man, I feel like we wasted time not having him back there because he, he really, from the Houston game on, really that fourth quarter, I felt like he's just been a totally different player since then. And, um, um, you know, obviously we hope he has a big year this year. Yeah. Yeah. Now I've heard Coach Brown or, and, and maybe even Chad Scott, but I've heard some of the coaches say they don't believe in gamers. And I, I just I don't know that I I did I, I don't know that I agree with that statement because I I played high school ball with guys who were like that they yeah. they might not even try hard at practice half the time yeah like they loaf at practice yeah I mean I feel and like, I'm, I'm not saying I condone that right but when you get in the game they'd be the best player on the field yeah I mean I feel you know? like quarterback position and maybe it's a little bit before your time that you remember um, is uh, Jake Kelsher was very much like that I felt mm-hmm. like it was yeah. very um and so um and you know some guys just have that charisma and have that about them and you know and and things just seem to work out for them even if they don't do the right things all the time based on how the play was drawn up they seem to find a way right yeah i I mean and to me i've always felt like he was that guy um just in general overall with the team what are your feelings going into the 2024 season Uh, i mean you know after coming off last year obviously you think about you know the um we got a chance to do something. We got a big game to start with. And so, you know, the, out of the gates, we can make a lot of noise and you'll find out who, who you have or what you got very early on. Um, 
you know, the big thing always with somebody playing like somebody uh, like Penn State is depth. How much depth do we have? Um, and, you know, now the big thing is, you know, what about the portal? You know, who are we, we going to lose guys? You know, are we going to have our full team? The guys that we lost, uh, can we replace them? Uh, you know, you used to be able to have a good feeling about one, the roster from one year to the next. Uh, but now that's, you know, that's always in question. And right. you got spring ball. You might – some guys might not be very happy and leave. And then, um, you know, then it happens all the way through summer camp, even, even in the early in the season, people can leave. So it's a very strange dynamic what's going on right now. Yeah. Um, that being said, I'm always for the player to be honest with you. And, um, you know, for years, um, coaches recruit kids, get them on campus, leave them, change jobs, you know, they have this freedom to go. They have the freedom to break the rules and kids suffer and the coach moves on. So, I, you know, I'm for the players having more power in a sense that they can transfer and do some things. Now, I do feel like there has to be some sort of limitations on it. Uh, kind of like what Harbaugh said where, you know, sometimes you just go on campus and, you know, you recruit it and everything, you know, you wind and dine. And, and then when you get there, it's not – all that you thought or your coach leads or something like that. I think you yeah. ought to transfer as long as you're in good academic standing, you're not in trouble with the law or something like that. You should be able to transfer at least once. You should be able to transfer once. No problem. And then, then after that, I think they're, you know, you got to look at some things and see, but I still think the kids ought to have some freedom. You know, if yeah. I'm, if I'm there on a math scholarship or a music scholarship and I want to go, uh, you know, I want to transfer somewhere else, then no one's going to hold me up on doing that where right. so they try to make these they've always tried to make players be like normal students but they're not normal students you know they're really not yeah. and so um that being said you should give them some freedom to do those things and of course now you're seeing it now it's like everything else the pendulum swings one way it's going yep. it, on they were so limiting back in the day now there's the too far it's got to come back a little bit yeah Yep, it's went from the ditch on one side to the ditch on the other side, as yeah. my pastor likes to say. Yeah. Um, no. Now nil though, man, you could have made some bank in your day, couldn't you? <laughs> I think so. Maybe I don't know. I mean, you know, hopefully uh, I could, could have been able to do that, but uh, may could have got you a little deal with Terry Ford. Yeah, maybe. So, maybe. <laughs> was he was he in business at that time? He was in business. Yes, yes. Maybe he would have. He may have been wanting a hometown discount. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, maybe I, I hope Toothman's not watching this. <laughs> Hey, but, my sponsors. Hey, I'll probably be quiet. My sponsors, Dutch Miller Automotive. I better not. Uh, I better <laughs> not say too much more. Um, shout out to Dutch Miller, by the way. Um, they got a new location in Beckley. Go check them out. Um, no, man, Chad, it's been an honor, man. Like I said, you uh, you're one of my favorite players, and you know maybe a lot of that's biased because of the Southern West Virginia connection, the play. You know the big play, like I told you about that I remember. Um, but it's been an honor to have you on here, man. Real quick, one more time, let let my listeners know where you know where, where they can find you at as far as uh, on social media and also, you know, wh- your business. Yeah, you can find me on social media. I'm on Twitter. Uh, I think I'm on Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat. I'm Golden Blue Eight, um, so I'm pretty easy to find. I, I, uh, I, um, I practice medicine in in Virginia in. Uh, Giles uh, County in, in Nares, and then we have an office in Blacksburg, and we actually have one in Roanoke as well. And so I, I spend my time in each each one of those offices. And uh, the name of my practice is River Ridge Dermatology. Yeah. So if you're in southern West Virginia, southwestern Virginia, or anywhere close, and you need a dermatologist, go go look at, look him up. Chad Johnson at River Ridge Dermatology. Chad, again, man, it's been an honor. Uh, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule, man. I appreciate you. Yes, thank you, and I appreciate your kind words. And and uh, you know, some some of my family had forwarded me the um, uh, the YouTube segment you did on my career, and I, I really appreciate that. That's that's very kind of you. Absolutely, man. That and I, an I honor I, honor to do it. I got to say, a shout out to my six guys or the, the five other guys that we hang out. They, I did one of these uh, last year. They gave me a hard time. I didn't say anything to them. So, you know, Randy Dunnigan, uh, Brian Pecanus, John Conte. Uh, Tanner Russell, Kevin Landalt, uh, and uh, who's the other? Is that is that all five? I got all five of them in there. I think yeah. I, th- I wasn't counting. I th- sound like five. I wasn't counting either. Deal. Good deal. There you go. He hey, he he lived up to his end of the bargain, guys. <laughs> <laughs> if I forgot somebody when I go to the beach, they're all linemen. 
I will, I'll be the little guy. I'll pay for that. So I apologize. I hear you. Yeah. Me That's right. That's right. Hey, all right. Again, thank you. Thanks, Chad. It's been an honor, man. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yep. Well, I hope you enjoyed my interview with Chad Johnston. It was an honor and a privilege to have him on the show. It's something he and I have been trying to work out for quite some time. I was glad we could finally make it happen. I ask that you please like, share, comment, and subscribe to the video. Please make sure to go check Chad out on social media. And again, if you live in southern West Virginia or southwestern Virginia and you are looking for a dermatologist, please go to River Ridge Dermatology and support Chad and his work. Have a top shelf day and Q Country Roads.